morning, church. I want to share a scripture with you. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Let's pray together. Father, as we set this time apart as a holy moment, when we make the decision to open your word and to learn and mature, we are reminded that the only source of pure truth is your holy word. It seems in our current day that we are more divided than we have ever been before. Our opinions have become so diverse that it seems like nothing can unify us. We become polarized in our thinking until we recognize that the purest form of truth is your holy word. It's timeless. It has been with us from the beginning. It is the purest source of how to live out our day-to-day -day life. It was breathed out by our God and our Creator. In your word is the instruction on how we are to think, how we are to live out our lives, how we are to work together, even when we don't see things eye to eye. You remind us through countless scriptures that there is a season for everything. There's a time to be born and a time to die. We recognize that we are in a season right now as a country. A difficult season. The best thing that we can do in the midst of this season is to continue to communicate with our divine creator. In other words, we need to be people of prayer, talking to you and asking you to guide us, to calm our hearts, and to give us insight. And then more than ever before do we need to become a people grounded in the word of God so that we know the good we ought to do. And then you help us and give us the strength to love our neighbor, to truly love our neighbor. Far harder to do when we don't agree with our neighbor. But that was not in your stipulation of if we should love, it was that we should. So, Father, as we embark into your word on this time together, we might not be unified in every detail of life, but we must be unified in understanding that what we are about to read is your very word. And in that truth, that this, this passage, this book that we are to read from was given to us, by God himself. That's where we find our unity. And then we read, what are we to do and how are we to do it? So Father, I ask that you would give all of us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. 
through the Holy Word of God. I ask this in Jesus' name and wherever you are, you can agree by saying amen and amen. It has been a difficult week here in this country. And I want to give you some discernment, some direction. Just last week, at the beginning of this year, we, we made a conscious decision to make a choice to, to walk down the ancient path, is how Scripture lays it out. To walk in the way that God had ordained us to walk which is not always the flashiest way. It's not always um, a way that is necessarily even easy. But one thing that I have heard a lot this week with the confusion of what's going on and the frustration and the hurt in everything that has happened this past week is I don't even know what the truth is. I have heard that from more people. I don't know what to believe. I don't know what the truth is. What I can tell you is that the Word of God is pure truth. We will never agree on everything. Actually, out of the 12 apostles that Jesus had walking with him, there was a zealot and a tax collector. Those were two opposing sides. And he called them to be unified, not in just their thinking, one collecting taxes for Rome and one a political zealot opposing all Roman rule, working together in Jesus Christ. That's what tied them together. One of the things that Jesus left us with, one of the last things that he said before ascending to heaven was that they will know that you are Christians by your love. These are things that are much harder to digest when we are frustrated and angry. But also scripture tells us in our anger, do not sin. Can we have righteous frustration and not hate our neighbor? Is there a way for you to mature, to despise the act that someone has done? but to have a righteous anger and then take these things to the Lord, to pray maybe like you've never prayed before. And one of the things that we need to understand is that all of the truth and all of the right thinking and all of the answers are available to you and to me in the Holy Word of God. This is why we have this tool to know this is the way we ought to walk out our lives. This is how we deal with frustrating situations. This is how we should think. This is what we should say and this is what we should not say. This is why he gave us the word of God. All truth is in the pages of Holy Scripture. It is up to you to make the decision either to walk down the ancient path or to try to continue to find some sort of fictitious peace that is based on merely circumstantial situations. In other words, everything needs to work out right for you to be at peace. That will never happen. But we can find peace in God. We can be anxious for nothing if we are in Christ. 
We can deal with frustrating and overwhelming times if we are in Christ and we remember that he said difficult times would come. Times that are unprecedented would come. What do we do as those that follow the teachings of Jesus Christ? What do we do more than ever should we be in the Word of God. If you have made that decision, I want to get into the Word of God. I just don't even know where to begin. This is a huge book. Then this is your morning. This is your time. Because what we're going to go over today is literally learning how to navigate our Bibles. How is it put together? Where do I start reading? What is this thing? It's massive. Sometimes we can be so overwhelmed by such a a large book and we, we understand it's an important book and we can even, maybe even we believe that it was written by God. If you can really digest that, but we just flop it open and we seem to point at a random verse and we read it and we hope that it inspires us for the day. That is not what God designed his word to work for you. That's not the the way to use the word of God. Now, sometimes God in his mercy will meet you in a desperate moment when you don't know what to do and you flop the Bible open, you point at a random verse and you look down and it says something inspiring. Well, that is wonderful, but that's not how God gave us his holy word. How do we actually read the Bible? If there was ever a time in our country's history, if there was ever a time in your personal life to make sure that you are getting into Holy Scripture, it's right now. More than ever before. This entire series that we've entitled The Ancient Path is based on the scripture out of Amos chapter 8 verse 11 that says, Behold, the days are coming declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. We are coming into a time when the word of God is far more rare than it will have ever been before. Where even the churches are fainting back from reading the Word of God. Maybe people think it's, it's outdated, or it's no longer relevant, or it's just too hard to read, or maybe, just maybe, the Word of God is too offensive. And so there becomes a famine. Even you and I can sometimes get to the point where we feel like this is an outdated text. And it doesn't fit in our current society. It doesn't line up with how we tend to think nowadays. This is why we've we've called this the ancient path. And scripture tells us to choose the ancient path. And that it's not that we change scripture to, to morph and to fit our every whim, our every bend in society. We recognize that this is the ancient landmark. This is the unmovable thing. This is not an old book, it's a timeless book. And it wasn't just written by, by men's opinion, it was breathed out by the creator of all things. Not written for just one generation 2,000 years ago, but passed down from generation to generation for you and for I today. That's why it's called the living word of God. So what do we do? What do we do when there's a troubling season about us? We go to the word of God and we pray 
like we've never prayed before. We do not get anxious. We do not mouth off with fury and anger. We become men and women of prayer. We become men and women of the word of God. If you will do that, I will show you how to navigate this massive document. If you want to learn how to actually navigate this huge book, let's turn together to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. So find your Bible in your home, let's pull it out, and let's see how this thing is put together. How did God bind all these books together? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Find it in your Bible. It's towards the end of your Bible. One of the ways that you can find it is if you don't know where Hebrews is, go to the very first pages of your Bible, all the way back uh, in the very, very beginning, and it'll give you a list of all the books in the Bible. And find Hebrews, turn to it, and then find chapter 4. And let's go down and look at verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active. Did you find that in your Bible, that the word of God, which is this holy scripture, is living and active? One of the first lessons to learning how to navigate your Bible is recognizing that it is a timeless book. And that it's not just a book, it's a library of books, 66 to be exact. Actually, the word Bible comes from the plural word bibliae, which means library. This is a library of holy books. So that's the first thing we want to understand is, yes, this is the holy scriptures, but it is 66 different books. And that it is alive. How is it alive though? That's a strange thing to say about a book. You begin to think like we're in some sort of science fiction movie and you open the book and it somehow comes alive, but it actually is more real than anything else that you can possibly think of. This book truly is living and active. And I'm going to show you a scripture that helps us explain what it means to be living and active in this book. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 says, "All scripture, all of it is breathed out by God." And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. How is this book living? Because it's breathed out by God. It's, it's his very breath that has made this book living. You are only living because there is breath in your lungs. When the breath leaves your lungs for a long enough period, you will cease to live. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says this about God making mankind, and it says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. That is literally what you and I are made of. It's just the, the same minerals that are in the earth is what have made up our body. And then it says that he made us from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. We became a living thing when the breath of God came into us. So, 
When we look at this big, huge book in front of you, recognize that God breathed into it. He breathed it out. It is alive. It is the living word of God. Somebody asked uh, this idea, how, the, how is the Bible living? And one of the best answers I've heard was, the Bible is living the same way that the music is in the organ. Now you can, if you're watching this on video, you can see this incredible organ behind us that we use every Sunday here in the church. Uh, one of the greatest gifts to this church is this beautiful, beautiful organ. But as you can see, if you look at this beautiful instrument, right now, it's just pieces and parts. It's beautiful, but it is just pieces and parts. And there is no music in the organ right now. It's just wood and pipes and levers thousands and thousands of levers and moving parts. So where is the music in the organ? Well, you have to breathe into it. See, when the organ is used, air is pumped into the organ. But if you pump air into the organ, there's still no music in the organ. But with the right person at the keyboard, playing the right way, with the right stops released, music comes out of the organ. It's the same thing with this book in front of you. The leather is not living. The binding is not living. The pages, the ink. Where is the music in your Bible? It's when it gets into you. When you begin to read the Word of God, that's when the music shows up. When it gets into your heart, when the right person sits behind this seat at this organ and uses the keyboard and all the pipes and all the timber and out of it comes the most majestic sound you've ever heard, there's the music in the organ. That's how we understand how to grasp that this is a living text because it needs the breath of God in it. God literally breathed out this text. Now, there were more than 40 writers that wrote down the actual words. It wasn't just penned by some mystical angelic being. God chose certain people at certain times, written over a thousand years of history, Different people throughout the ages, God would speak to them and they would write it down. They'd, they'd write down all different uh, pieces of scripture that they were told to by God. And what's beautiful is from 40 different authors, some of them never met each other over a thousand year span of writing one beautiful, succinct book. It's there's incredible harmony, perfect harmony in this book. And I wanna show you why. When you look down at your Bible, you see 66 different books inside one book with all these different names. Some of them are named after the author. Some of them are named after um, their purpose. Some of them are named after the church that it was written to. Some were actually written because when you would open the original scroll, it was just the first words. So Genesis, for example, meant the beginning. So that's why they called it the beginning. And they called it Genesis. That's how you open the scroll when it was first written. How, how in the world did 40 authors from all these different walks of life come out with such a succinct, beautifully harmonized collection 
Well, because there was only one author, though 40 different writers. That's the right way to understand this text. How do you navigate your Bible? The first thing you must understand is it's alive and written by 40 plus people with one author. It's a living book written by the creator himself. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, the apostle Paul is speaking to a group of people and he literally said this, which I think is very helpful. He said, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you, had, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. So when we learn how to read this text, one of the first mental practices that we must master right out of the gate is this is not an opinion. I agree with it. I don't agree with it. I'm not really sure. Maybe Moses was a little off when he wrote this. And I didn't really like how Paul worded that. It seemed a little off base. Wait. Paul didn't write it. God wrote it. And that's why Paul said, when you receive it, you need to accept it for what it really is. It's God who wrote this. So whether you agree with it or not is really not the point. I hope that makes sense. Because otherwise it becomes just another opinion. And I tell you, there are plenty of books that will give you different perspectives and opinions. That is not what this book is for. This text was not written to be another random opinion in your library. Another way for you to think if you agree with it. When we come to this text, when we open the word of God, the best way to navigate it is the first thing to think of is, God, I submit to your written word as it is written. Now we read it. But we can't read it if we go to it with maybe I like it and maybe I don't or maybe it needs to change and maybe that is we'll never be able to fully understand and digest this sacred writing. If we come to it with a red pen where we cross out the sections that we don't like. I've literally been told I don't like it when you read this scripture. I don't like it when you quote that scripture. We can't go through the Bible with our red pen and cross out the things that we don't really like and circle the ones that we do like. God so loved the world. That's a good one. I'll circle that one. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No, I don't like that. I don't like anything that holds me accountable. I like the ones that say this thing. I don't really like it when it says that thing. The first lesson to really digesting and navigating through scripture is that it is alive and all of it is accurate. So lesson one is there. Now let's get down to some very simple basics. Let's open the book. Let's go all the way to the beginning of the book. Let's go all the way to the book of Genesis. Very first page. Let's see how this thing is put together. The first five books in your Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Maybe you've heard this word before, the Pentateuch. Pentateuch, Penta is five. Those are the books of the law. God speaking through the person of Moses, this is my law for my people. So when you read through those books, you're going to see a lot of laws for that day and that time. 
Even the covenant is made in that time, a covenant between God and man. You'll see in the very first pages of Scripture uh, in Genesis the, how everything started. Probably the most profound chapter in all of Scripture is the very first one. In the beginning, God. And this is how it all came to be. When you read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and following, you recognize that there are a lot of details that are left out. God did not give us a scientific text he gave us a very simple text. Something that all of us could understand. It, it doesn't lay out all the beautiful nuances and scientific language of how he made the tree. He said he made three different vegetations. Ground vegetation like grass, bushes, and trees. He made it very simple for us. Now we know that he made billions of trees and multiple different varieties and, and the shrubs all over the globe and the different grasses and the mosses. But he gave us a very simple text, something that we could understand, what we needed to know. Science and scripture go hand in hand. One of the most beautiful forms of worship is the study of the things that God has made. That's why science is beautiful. Keep researching. The more we look into what God has made, the more beautiful God becomes. Same thing goes, the farther we look out into space, the bigger God gets. Keep looking, keep studying. It is the most purest form of worship is to really look into the things that God created. So that's the beginning of your Bible. Then you see that it changes quickly from the creation story into how we got here and then how we fell from what God told us to do and then the ramifications of that fall lead out over the rest of Genesis. And one of the things I wanna point out is from the end of Genesis to the beginning of Exodus, there's a 400 year gap in history. So that's a, that's a long time to have this God not saying anything. But those are the first five books, are the law of God. After that, we have history. Beginning with Joshua, there are 12 books all the way down to Esther. You'll see Judges and Ruth and First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. All of that are history books. The history of how God moved things and how things happen. Then you'll get into the poetry books. Poetry is like Job and Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. They're beautiful poetry. If you're ever lost and you don't know where to go in scripture, instead of flopping over to a random history book that gives you the history of a certain time and a certain area or send of busting back into the law and jumping into Exodus somewhere, it's a good idea to go to poetry like the book of Psalms. Psalms was like our current day hymnal. They're succinct thoughts captured in chapters, 150 of them. And you can read just a chapter, sometimes just a verse in that chapter. That's where we find things like, the Lord is my shepherd shall not want, maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's a beautiful poem. So if you're looking for something to turn to in your Bible, where you say, I just, I just need something quick. I, I don't have a lot of time. Maybe instead of coming up with a long reading plan and flopping back into a long history section or back into the law section, that's when we can use the poetry, or some of them are even called books of wisdom, like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. One quick note, the book of Proverbs has 31 chapters. If you plan that out, that's 31 days in a given month. So you can read whatever the date is and just say, I'm gonna go to Proverbs that date. Pick the number and just read through it and you'll find words of wisdom, 
always words of wisdom. These are things you should do. These are things you should stay away from. Very practical things, like don't answer a fool according to their folly. That's a great lesson. So if that was the proverb of the day, you can just turn to the book of Proverbs, which is almost right in the middle of your Bible, and you find that uh, particular day, and you read that verse, and you say, you know what? I'm not going to try and argue with somebody that I know is just not even going to hear what I have to say. A lot of wisdom in that. But they're also in succinct packages versus the history is separated into long historical references of things that happened. Then we get into what's called the prophetic books. Starting with Isaiah all the way down to Daniel, there are five what are called major prophets. Prophets are those that heard from God and were speaking to the people. The way God was speaking in the Old Testament was he would speak through a prophet to all of his people. And that's what these prophetic books are, the books of the prophets. So like the prophecy of where the Christ child would be born or uh, unto us a child is given, unto us a son is born, that kind of prophetic, it will eventually happen. That's in Isaiah. Then you have the minor prophets. There are 12 books in the minor prophets. The only reason that these are called major and these are called minor are these are really big and these were really small. Not that these are less important and these are more important, just these we have more writings of and we don't have as many writings of the smaller ones. That is the prophet or prophetic books. Five major, 12 minor. Again, five really large ones, 12 smaller ones. Then you see that there's a huge shift between, that's the Old Testament, which is 39 books altogether, and then you shift over to the New Testament, where there are 27 books. By the way, the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. There again, is another 400-year gap, and in that 400-year gap, we have some other writings that showed up. Um, that's part of the stuff that you'll see like listed in one of the Catholic Bibles has uh, seven books that are not in uh, your Bible. Uh, that's when those were written. It's not that they're bad books, they're historical books, but they're not written by God. They weren't written and breathed out by God. They were written in a time when God wasn't talking. And that's the end of Malachi before the book of Matthew in the New Testament. So that's where those came from. They're not bad books. They're just not inspired by God. They're like any other historical books. They're good. They're just not part of the canon of Scripture. Then you get into the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the story of Jesus. Who he was, how he was born, what did he do, where did he go? The story of salvation, the good news. The word gospel means good news. If you don't know where to start in your Bible, I would use Proverbs and Psalms as kind of a go-to daily fix. But I would start reading if you want uh, to actually read a section in those four gospels. Learn about Jesus. Jesus is the center of all of Scripture. So go to those Gospels and read about who Jesus was. Then you get the book of Acts. Acts is another history book. Acts literally is the Acts of the Apostles. After Jesus left, the Apostles began building the church and spreading this great news about Jesus to the whole world. Acts tells you this is what they did. This is where they went. This is what they said. This is what happened. That's the book of Acts. Then we go into Romans. And this, these are Paul's letters to churches. The Apostle Paul, who never actually met Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He started churches, and then he would write letters to the churches about things they should do and things they shouldn't do. So you have nine letters to churches, from Romans all the way through to 2 Thessalonians. So if you're looking for what we are to do as Christians, 
You're going to find it in Paul's letters to churches. How are we supposed to do this church? That's where we find out. Then there are, uh, let's see, I believe there are four. Yeah, four letters that are also written by Paul, but they weren't written to churches. They were written to Paul's friends. One of them even called his brother. It, was, uh, uh, it wasn't his blood brother. But those first and second Timothy, Titus, and uh, Philemon. Those were all books that Paul wrote to certain people for certain purposes. We also call those uh, pastoral epistles. There's a lot about how to be a leader and how church is supposed to have leaders. And he's writing to Timothy and he's saying, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to do it. Um, and then you have what's called general letters. These are um, how we live out our lives, do's and don'ts. You find those in what's called the general letters. And those are nine books the last one being the book of Revelation, which is also a prophetic book. Because Revelation, the very last book in your Bible, tells us a lot about what will happen. So it's again another prophecy. God saying, this is what to expect. So it is a letter because it was written down by a man named John, the Apostle John. But John gave it to all the churches. So it was considered a letter that he gave to the churches of what will happen. So those are the 66 books of your Bible. Now you know where they are. One of the things I want to kind of point out to you though is you'll notice that the Bible is not in topical order. It doesn't say this is, if you want to learn about love, go there. If you want to learn about peace, go over here. Because scripture is not in a topical order, the best way for us to understand a study of a given topic is that it's littered throughout all the pages of Scripture. So, uh, for example, if you want to do a study on the person of Jesus, who was Jesus? I know he's the Son of God, but I want to learn more about him. You could go to those Gospels, the first four books in the New Testament, but when Jesus was teaching about himself, he said that he was, this is Luke chapter 24, verse 27. This is after Jesus rose from the dead. He's walking down the road with two men. And he says this, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Now, remember, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible that we talked about, starting with Genesis. He said, starting with Moses, the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, that's pretty much the rest of the entire Old Testament, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus, walking down the road, talked to these two men using the Old Testament about himself. So is Jesus in the Old Testament? Yeah. His life story is in those four books in the New Testament, we call the Gospels, but he is prophesied all through the Bible. So to do a topical study in your Bible, you're going to find yourself going all over the place. And that's when you see how beautiful the Bible is, that it's all knit together. And it really confirms itself that something's written here and it's also written over there and how that's when we can really see, wow, it is one divine author. I want to show you five biblical tools on how to read that book in front of you. Number one and most important, you need to read it with reverence. We already talked about this. This is a living book. It is the very word of God. So you need to open it with reverence. Don't get flippant with it. Don't just, I only have two minutes, so hurry up and talk to me, God. Whoa, you are opening the divine word of God. Take a beat, take a deep breath, talk to God. God, help me to have my head on straight. Give me understanding. So read your word in front of you with reverence. That's number one. Then you want to number two, make sure you read it in context. What I mean by that is, 
Because it is a large book and because we can bounce around from scripture to scripture, one of the things that really gets us in trouble is when we take a passage of scripture out of its context and we just quote it all by itself. You wouldn't do that with any other book. You'd always read the the text in its context. So if you're reading about the law, you don't just want to pull some random thing out there and take it out of its context and say, I don't agree with this. Well, it's probably not in its context. So make sure you read around whatever it is that you're reading. So let's say that you're reading a, um, a passage in uh, Exodus and you're reading about um, a certain thing that happened and you find a verse that really either inspires you or upsets you. Make sure you read before it and you read after it. Another way to look at it is to scan out away from the focus zoomed in lens of that one verse. Scan out and let's read before it and after it and always read scripture in context. A third thing you can do about reading your Bible is a topical study. How we do this is using something called the concordance, which we'll get to in a little bit. But you can actually use the scriptures instead of just reading it like a history book or just reading a poetry. You can actually go and look something up, a certain topic, like the words of my mouth. What should I be saying and what should I not be saying? And you can go and just look that up and it'll take you to the book of James. It tells you what you should say and what you shouldn't say, but it'll also take you back uh, into the Old Testament and tell you the words of your mouth have a lot, of a, a lot of power. Did we not see that this past week, that people's words hold a lot of power? So you can do a study about our words in your Bible. Another thing I want you to learn to do is something called cross-referencing. If you have your Bible open, you'll notice that uh, whether it's in the margin or on the bottom, you'll see all these little tiny numbers and letters that is showing you that whatever verse you're on and whatever word you're on is somewhere else in the Bible. So if you were to read, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, you'll realize, okay, that's in John 3.16. But if you look in that little cross reference, it'll show you where else in the Bible it says that God so loved the world. Or... It'll show you where else it says that God sent his only son. So let's make sure that we're using those cross-references. Use those little numbers and those little um, areas in the either margin or the bottom of your Bible to move all over your Bible. That's how you're going to learn to navigate your Bible. And lastly is the concordance. That's the fifth thing. The concordance all the way in the back of your Bible you can find a word, you can find a topic, and it'll show you all the verses in the Bible where that word is mentioned. So if you wanna look up love, you can go to the back of your Bible, go to the concordance, look up love, and they'll give you 25, 35, or 125 different scriptures, and then go look them up. So five simple things. Number one, come with reverence. Two, make sure you read it in context. Three, you can look topically through it. Number four, use those cross-references to see where else God has said this. And number five, you can use that concordance. In the Old Testament, those first books in the Bible, it covers almost 4,000 years of history. The New Testament only covers 70 years of history. So remember, we're reading this book and under, we have to understand that there's a lot of history covered in the Old Testament. And we have some historical books. In the New Testament, a very short period of time, 33 years of Jesus and then several years of the apostles and Paul, especially until Revelation and it's over, it's done. I wanna go back though, as we close our time together, and finish reading Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. I've given you a lot of information about navigating your Bible. Now you see how it's put together. And in the following weeks, I'm gonna show you how to read the Bible specifically 
not just how to navigate it, but actually how to read it. And I'm also gonna show you how to study it, to get even deeper than just kind of reading it every morning and kind of a surface level. We're gonna go deeper and deeper each week on how to move through this text. But let's go back to Hebrews 4 for just a minute as we close. Hebrews 4 verse 12 we began by saying, for the word of God is living and active. But then it says this, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow. This book pierces into our heart unlike any other book. One, because it's living. But I want to show you that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, it literally says that from his mouth, this is Jesus, came a sharp two-edged sword. It, his word, his speaking, we get this imagery of God that it's like a sharp, piercing word. This is why when you read the word of God and you read it correctly, sometimes it's very piercing into us. It shows us the things in our life that need to change or adjust. That's a good thing. You should constantly be refined by reading this Bible. It's not just an informational book. You shouldn't read it and just go, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that before. No, you should recognize that this word is like a fire. I'll show you. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. When we look at this book and we begin to read it correctly, it pierces into our hearts sometimes and it burns off the junk, and it breaks up the tough stuff. This is why when we see difficult things going on in the world, go to this book. It'll show you how to think, it'll show you how to process, so that the unrighteous things burn off, and the righteous things remain. The last thing that it says, after saying that it, it pierces like a two-edged sword, it says, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is a discerning word. The word gets into us. This is why we, we treasure his word in our heart. Actually, Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So now you know how to navigate your Bible. Now you know how it's put together. But let's make sure we get it into us. Remember, like the wind coming into the organ is where the music eventually comes from. Let's get the word of God into us because then this happens. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 105. Again, one of those poetry books. Your word, this book, is a lamp to my feet. It shows me how to walk and a light to my path. I don't have to be confused anymore. I have his word hidden in my heart. And this is how I want to close. I want to show you that there needs to be a sense of seeking after God. Just last week, we, we made the decision to choose the ancient path. This week, we're learning how to navigate that path. How do we navigate through this book? You need to earnestly seek after God. You have, you have to actually put effort into this. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you treat this book flippantly, literally, in the morning, you flop it open, you point to it, and you go, I didn't really get anything. I don't even know how to read it. And you leave it. You did not seek after God with all your heart, so you're not going to find him. But if you invest 
the time and the energy and the the spiritual willingness to really honestly seek after God, you will find him where he wants to be found, which is the pages of scripture. So make this confession. The first scripture I would love for you to read is Psalm 63. It's that poetry book that we talked about, or kind of like the hymnal. Psalm 63, and then claim it for yourself. And I'm going to read just verse 1 for you. You can read the rest of it later. But verse 1 says this. It's a declaration that you're going to make to God. Not to me. Make this to God. Open your Bible and then just make this confession to God. It says this. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. God, we began our time together by hearing that there would be a famine in the land of the Word of God. But we recognize that the famine is not about the availability of the Word of God. It's just that we're choosing not to read it. But if we confess Psalm 63, that we are thirsty for you, we are hungry to seek after you and to find you in your word, we know that the promise is you will meet us when we open these pages. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's been passed down from generation to generation, given to us today. But today we again make that conscious decision. No matter what's going on in the world around us, and no matter how overwhelming it might seem, we must continue to put you first. For that's the only place where we will find rest and peace and calm. The only place where we will find a sense of unity And more important than everything, it's where we will find truth. So God, you are our God, and earnestly we will seek after you. Father, we thank you that when we seek you, the promise is we will find you. Thank you for your holy word. And as we close our time together, let's pray together the way that this word taught us to pray. All in agreement from wherever you are and whenever you hear this, we agree by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you all. Until we meet again.